Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the American Sheep Industry Association, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's webinar titled Looking Towards the Future of Parasite Management Through Host-Colored Glasses. My name is Jay Parsons, and I will start by saying thank you to the American Sheep Industry Association and its Rebuild the Sheep Industry Initiative, along with the American Sheep Industry Improvement Center for sponsoring and funding this evening's program. We are very pleased to have with us this evening presenter Dr. Scott Bowdridge of West Virginia University. Dr. Bowdridge is originally from California, but he's has since transplanted himself to the eastern U.S. He's currently assistant professor of food animal production in the Department of Animal and Nutritional Sciences at West Virginia University in Morgantown, West Virginia. And prior to that, he did his Ph.D. work at Virginia Tech University in Blacksburg, Virginia. I'll be turning the program over to Dr. Bowdridge in one moment, but before I do that, I have a couple of logistics things to um, hold on to here. Okay, this program is scheduled for one hour and 15 minutes. The last 30, of min 30 minutes of which is scheduled for questions and answers. There are two ways you can address your uh, questions to Dr. Bowdridge. The first way is to simply raise your hand by clicking the hand icon on your GoToWebinar um, dashboard. We can get to the Q&A portion of the program. Uh, we'll work our way through those raised hands and give as many of you as possible the opportunity to ask your questions. In order to ask your question, you will need to uh, have a microphone either built into your computer or um, connected to your computer. Or you could have called in on the, using the call-in number, but you need to make sure you enter in that uh, PIN number that was given to you. Don't worry, right now all of your microphones are muted um, by the webinar hosting software. But when we get to that portion of the program, if your hand is up and it's your turn to ask your question, we'll unmute your microphone and give you the chance to converse with Dr. Bowdridge directly. The second way you can submit your questions is by typing them into the question box in the uh, GoToWebinar dashboard. You can do that at any time throughout the program, and we'll try to address as many of them as possible, along with the other questions during the Q&A portion of the program. If you think your location is pertinent to your question, keep in mind if you type it into that box, you'll need to let us know where you're located. Um, probably the easiest way to do that is just do a two-state uh, postal uh, abbreviation either at the beginning or end of your question if you haven't said it directly in there. The last log logistical item is to let everyone know that this program is being recorded and it will be made available on the American Sheep Industry website. Their web URL is sheepusa.org and you can access this and all of our previous webinars by clicking on our Rebuild the Sheep uh, Inventory menu item. In addition, all registrants for this evening's program will, will receive a follow-up email in the next few days with information on how to access the recording. So with that, I want to turn the screen and the microphone over to Dr. Bowdridge for his presentation. And I think we can see that okay now. Okay, so the floor is yours, Dr. Bowdridge. All right. Well, thank you, Jay, for the introduction, and thank you, everybody, for attending this conference or uh, webinar. It's it's interesting format of um, presenting information across the country, and I look forward to a lively discussion as we introduce this idea of parasite management from a from a host perspective. Uh, my interest in parasite management just started as a young man uh, working with sheep. Um, you can see here I was packing wool for my father while he was shearing a, a large group of animals over in Southern California. Um, I spent uh, a good uh, bit of time in Maine where I was introduced to some fellows out there by the name of um, Tom Settlemeyer and Charles Parker and, and Richard Brzezowski. Um, these guys started a SARE grant um, that was rebuilding or, or kind of revitalizing the Katahdin breed and, and upgrading that breed to improve some, some carcass characteristics and some uh, reproductive characteristics of that animal while maintaining uh, parasite resistance. And because of the genetic work that we're doing there, I found myself kind of drawn down to Virginia Tech and working with Dave Nodder 
um, and looking at some of the immunogenetics and, and some of the immunology that's occurring um, in these animals um, at such an early stage. So since my time at Virginia Tech, I um, did a postdoc for, at a medical school in New Jersey and, and really became much more interested in uh, the immune function and what's happening from an immunological standpoint in the parasite-resistant sheep. Um, uh, during different stages of the infection, uh, just in hopes that we can eventually get to that point where we can find a selectable marker for this, for this trait. So, it's always nice to uh, to begin some of these discussions with a quote, and, and this particular quote I found uh, while I was preparing for my um, um, my uh, preliminary examinations for, uh, during my doctorate, and in our uh, parasite immunology lab or our parasitology lab at uh, Virginia Tech, there was a, a microscope that had quite a large book underneath it holding it up so we could actually see it while we were doing fecal egg counts. And the book that was holding up the microscope, I, I got the itch one day to take the microscope off and look at the book and, and actually read it. And it, the book was entitled Veterinary Helminthology. It was published in 1949. And I found myself just kind of fast forwarding to the part where they're talking about uh, homunculus and, and some sheep. And I found this really interesting quote and I've used it quite a bit. And, and, and I think it's um, a nice look backwards. So I just want to want to read through this and, and um, see what you think about it. So after symptoms of this infection, and they're talking about uh, homunculosis, have been seen, the time necessary for fattening lambs is greatly increased and requires the use of more expensive grains for finishing than in non-parasitized lambs. Therefore, the prime requisite of economical sheep production is raising sheep that do not suffer from parasitism. So in 1949, Dr. Morgan, the, um, one of the gentlemen who wrote this book, had the idea that we need to be raising sheep that don't suffer from parasitism because they didn't have any drugs to really use. On the next page that followed this, um, this timely quote, there was an instructions on how to mix nicotine um, to give to sheep to treat um, parasites. And that was really the only drug that they had at the time. Since then, we've really exploded in terms of the number of chemotherapeutics that we use to treat parasitism. And that is um, ultimately why we're having this conversation today. So the parasites that I'm referring to and I'm going to be talking about through the rest of this section um, are belong to a family of parasites called Trichostrongylidae. These parasites um, include, and some of the critters found in this family include Trichostrongylus colibriformis. This is a uh, parasite of the small intestine. It's commonly referred to as the Brankrup uh, worm. Um, this uh, worm kind of buries into the small intestine, kind of disrupts uh, digestion in that um, part of the gut. And as a result, you'll see quite a bit of diarrhea produced. And we'll actually measure uh, uh, folks down in the other parts of the world, uh, measure what's called a DAG score, how much um, diarrhea is actually adhered to the um, to the wool of those animals. Another type of parasite that we see in this group is called Telodrosagia circumcincta. Uh, if you raise cattle, this is one of the worms that you worry about in terms of ostrichia. Hey, it's hey, Scott. Cousin inch. Scott. Yes. Can you hold on a second? There's something with the I audio. Sure um, our okay. audio didn't get broadcasted here, so we're gonna we're gonna redo this start here. Sorry about that. Huh. I was okay. just getting messages. People can see your slide, but they're not catching our audio. So I'm gonna okay. go back and uh, we'll stop the recording and restart. So I'd like to go ahead and welcome Dr. Scott Bowdridge of West Virginia University uh, with his presentation, Looking Towards a Future of Parasite Management Through Host Colored Glasses. Thank you for the introduction, Jay, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight. And I feel like I got a good 10 minutes of practice in <laughs> the first time, so I can uh, do this a little bit better the second time around. Um, I hope everybody is going to enjoy this tonight, and I'd like to take just a little bit different look in terms of parasite management. I think most of us have been indoctrinated about the um, the need and necessity to manage the parasite in the pasture, but I think that we've lacked the emphasis on looking at managing the host or really kind of coming at this from a host perspective. So that's that's kind of uh, where I'd like to go tonight. But um, since I'm fairly new on the scene or, or new and 
and kind of the nation. Uh, I just want to give a little bit of background about myself and, and how I um, got interested in this particular topic. Um, I grew up on a small sheep farm in Southern California. That's me packing wool for my dad as he was shearing a group of sheep out um, out there. And, um, you know, really my interest in this began as being interested in sheep and sheep production in general. Um, I taught high school ag for a few years in Central California and then moved out to Maine and, and ran into a group of folks out there that um, that had a SARE project where they were um, upgrading Katahdin's by using Dorset and, and introducing some Suffolk and trying to improve the carcass characteristic um, of the Katahdin breed while maintaining uh, parasite resistance. So Tom Settlemeyer and Charles Parker and, and Dick Brzezowski, those, those fellows really kind of guided me and, and got me interested in this particular um, um, area of research. And because we were doing some work with genetics, I just kind of migrated down to uh, Virginia Tech and working with Dave Notter there, um, looking at um, kind of the immunogenetics and what's happening in the immune response um, in the uh, parasite resistant sheep upon infection with uh, with homonchus. And and really as I as I left Virginia Tech and, and did a postdoc at a medical school, we were really focused on the, the immunology and have become much more interested in, um, and, and that's the basis of our research program here at WVU is to look at the uh, immunobiology of parasite resistance uh, in the Katahdin hair or in the uh, St. Croix hair sheep. So to begin this discussion I'd like to start with a quote and, and, and the quote comes from kind of a different place and I was in the um, um, in our parasitology lab at Virginia Tech and we were doing fecal egg counts one night and I got bored while we were doing all this and, and decided to take one of the books that was propping the microscope up and actually look at it for once. And, and one of these large books that were propped underneath the microscope was entitled Veterinary Helminthology and it was a book from 1949. So as I was perusing this book, I quickly fast forwarded to the section that dealt with homonchus and I just kind of wanted to see what the thoughts were at the time. and. I ran across a very interesting quote that I think is very pertinent for today's discussion. So I wanted to read that quote to you um, because it just drives everything that we're going to talk about today. So in 1949, Dr. Morgan and his co-authors wrote, um, after symptoms of this infection of hemongosis have been seen, the time necessary for fattening lambs is greatly increased and requires the use of more expensive grains for finishing than in non-parasitized lambs. Therefore, the prime requisite of economical sheep production is raising sheep that do not suffer from parasitism. So on the very next page of this, um, of this veterinary helminthology book is the treatment regime to treat these animals that, that have parasitism. And, and the treatment of the time was a mixture of nicotine that they were um, administering to the animal. So um, although Dr. Morgan found it a, um, important to stress the fact to, um, to raise sheep that suffer from parasitism. We have often turned to drugs or uh, chemotherapeutics because it's an easier approach and because it's an easier and more effective way uh, to really see fast differences and, and reductions in um, parasite um, problems. And, and because of the chemotherapeutic uses and the drugs that we've used, that's uh, really the reason why we're talking today. So the parasites that I'm referring to belong to a family of, um, of nematode or worm parasites called Trichostrongylidae. And some of the parasites in this group inc include the parasite named Trichostrongylus colibriformis. This is a parasite that affects the small intestine. It's also known as the bankrupt worm. This worm uh, causes quite a bit of diarrhea. It's actually one of the symptoms of, um, of infection, and it's one of the reasons that we commonly indicate diarrhea as a, um, as a uh, um, symptom of parasitism. Um, the guys down in Australia and New Zealand deal with this parasite quite frequently, and we have some uh, trichostrongylus that strikes, uh, say, in the uh, eastern United States from time to time as well. Another parasite that we deal with commonly is called Telodrosagia circumcincta. Uh, this parasite is uh, found in the abomasum. If you happen to be a cattle producer as well, you're pretty familiar with this fellow because he's the one that causes ostertagia, or a similar cousin of his, causes ostertagia in beef cattle. Um, this parasite uh, invades the, uh, the lining of the abomasum, disrupts the ability to convert peps into pepsinogen, and thus this parasite can't um, digest any kind of protein. And finally, and really the parasite that we're going to worry the most about today is called homonchus contortus. Um, 
most of us in the sheep industry, or at least in the western United States, or the eastern United States, are really familiar with this critter. Um, he's a blood feeding parasite that lives in the Avomasum, and, and this parasite, uh, amongst with his um, relatives here in this family, all have a very similar life cycle. Um, if you follow my cursor on the screen here, you can see that the parasites start, um, or the eggs start, as a, a result of reproduction inside the host. Um, so that result of reproduction, or the egg, is going to get shed in the feces onto the pasture. Now, if the weather is suitable, these larvae will hatch out. And what we mean by suitable weather is hot and moist. So we really need some good warm weather. We need it to be fairly humid outside. And that's typically why we've seen this parasite, um, especially in the southeastern United States. So this parasite's going to hatch out on pasture and develop what's uh, into the uh, third larval stage. And if you follow my cursor over to the right, you'll see Homonchus contortus in its third larval stage here on the right. And that's what they look like on the um, after we uh, um, culture them in, in vitro. But um, these parasites will be out there on blades of, in water droplets on blades of grass, sitting there waiting for their host to come along and consume them. In about two to three weeks, we'll see um, those larvae develop inside the gut. And after that, or um, at about two or three weeks, we'll start seeing eggs shedding out in their feces. So these larvae, once they're consumed, are going to migrate with the digesta down to the abomasum. They're going to stop in the abomasum. They're going to develop into their fourth and adult stage and start uh, feeding on blood in their host. And that's why homonchus is such a, uh, a problem in, in the sheep industry. It's also known as the barber pole worm, and it's a voracious blood feeder. So you can see these parasites all lined over across the mucosa of the um, um, of the abomasum. And it's interesting because this parasite doesn't necessarily invade the tissue. It actually develops outside or in the mucosa of the animal um, or uh, external in the, in the mucosa of the animal and it um, uh, without having a tissue dwelling phase. So these voracious blood feeders, each one of these uh, boys and girls in here are going to eat about half of, or um, about 500 or 50 microliters of blood each day, which is about 0 0.05 milliliters. If you think about a small drop of water, that's approximately 50 milliliters. Multiply that by a thousand, now you're looking at 50 milliliters of of blood per day in those animals. So ultimately what homonchus infection results in is anemia. And the body's response to lack of blood is to fill blood volume with anything it can, with any kind of water or fluid, um, to make sure that you're, you're uh, carrying certain blood volume in those animals. So that's why they, they become very anemic, very thin. Um, and don't uh, necessarily perform as well. This anemia in lambs can result in very rapid death. Uh, what makes this a, uh, a real problem to deal with is the fact that these worms are very seasonal. So homonchus is one of those parasites that can experience what uh, us college folks call hypobiosis or arrested development. So these, um, these parasites can know what's going on in the outside environment of the animal and they know to stop developing and they will arrest and go into hypobiosis until environmental conditions are correct, which typically are associated with spring lambing. So they get some kind of cue from the host that says that environmental conditions outside are correct for development. Those worms will continue development, and that's what uh, attributes to what we call the spring rise phenomenon, especially what we see here in the southeastern or further in the southeastern United States. So homonchus particularly is found year-round in warm and wet climates. Think Louisiana, Arkansas anywhere along the Gulf Coast we're going to see uh, homonchus year-round. It's a summer parasite for the rest of us. So anywhere where it gets really cold in the wintertime, um, that's where we're not going to see uh, homonchus so much over the winter. We're going to see more of that. Um, it, it really needs that really warm environment. And in addition to its seasonality and its voracious blood feeding, it's also very prolific. These females are going to produce anywhere from five to 10,000 eggs per day. So ultimately, because this parasite has so many um, um, problems to deal with, most of our parasite management strategies have been focused on this critter specifically um, in trying to manage its effect on, um, on parasitism. So when we get into this management of uh, parasites um, on pasture, we become and we, we really get to this pathogen-centric approach. And I stole this... Um, this image off a Canadian website, and, and Dr. Peregrine at the uh, University of Guelph will have to um, um, accommodate me here. But 
what we're looking at is a very typical, very normal kind of plan to manage parasites on pasture. So we're trying to reduce the parasitic load on pasture and just manage this level of pasture contamination as being the first point in this plan. The second point is to use anthelmintics appropriately. So anthelmintics is our college boy term for dewormers. So by using anthelmintics of, um, appropriately, we can maintain their efficacy for a longer period of time. By monitoring and treating animals selectively and not uh, using a prophylactic treatment, we're still hoping to maintain that anthelmintic efficacy. We want to quarantine and treat new introductions into the herd. If we find any um, points of treatment failure, we need to investigate those by actually isolating some of those parasites and seeing what they're resistant to, and it all starts again. So this type of plan in combination with FAMACHA, and if you're not familiar with the fam uh, the FAMACHA program, this is a way of scoring the um, the color or the redness of the ocular membrane in the eye as a way to measure anemia or infection with homologous. So if you've got animals that are grazing pasture and you assume that they are expect or suspect that they have a parasite infection, we can actually correlate that color of their eye to a, a um, uh, infection with homonchus. Although it's not necessarily indicative of that, there's many other causes of anemia, it's a very good tool to determine what animals need to be uh, treated with the dewormer as opposed to treat, treating the entire group. So it's, you know, this program has been very successful in mitigating some of these parasite program or uh, problems and also getting us to a point where we can selectively deworm the animals. But with the pathogen-centric approach in terms of managing the level of pasture contamination and using anthelmintics, you're going to see this term pop up over and over and over again with these approaches is anthelmintic, treat, treat, anthelmintic. Um, it's absolutely reliant on the effectiveness of dewormers. So all of this assumes that we still have some level of efficacy of the dewormers that we have to use currently. And I think that many of us know that that's not actually the case. When dewormers came out, they were tremendously effective. They worked fantastically. They were just really great. I remember when Ivamet came out as a, as a young man on a, on, a, on a sheep farm, I remember my dad being kind of happy about being able to deworm ewes that were pregnant. And that was one of the great things about these drugs, but that's no longer the story. This is a study done by um, uh, some researchers at the University of Georgia. It was published in 2008, and it just focuses on the effect of homonchus contortus. We can look at the resistance status of about 46 farms to benzimidazoles, which are BZ, any of the white dewormers. So think uh, valbazin, Safeguard, Panicure, uh, finbendazoles, or albendazoles fall into this group. If we look directly down here, see of the 46 farms that were tested, 43 of them showed resistance to benzimidazoles. And this study was done in the southeastern United States, so we're going to keep that in mind for just a moment. The next column looks at levamisole. We all know what levamisole is. That's the one that comes in that, um, in that pouch. Um, it's, I think it's marketed under the trade name of Prohibit. That's the one that you get the flash email about that all of a sudden is available through Valley Vet or whatever your supplier is. And then you get everybody and their brother calling up these companies and hoarding boxes of Levamisol because it's just, you never know when it's going to be available. So right now, or at least in 2008, we're seeing kind of a fairly normal distribution in terms of the amount of susceptible or the susceptibility to resistance with this, with it skewing slightly towards being uh, becoming more resistant. But you have to remember that Levamisol is one of the oldest drugs that we have on the market. It's one of the first really good chemotherapeutics that was um, released least to sheep producers, so we're going to see a little bit more history with that in terms of having some resistance. And then we come to ivermectin. So this is your ivermectin group, even though it's still the uh, market under, under a generic name now. Um, the ivermectin was great because it was safe to use 10 times its effective dose. You could give it to pregnant use. Um, you could give it as an injectable, um, as a drench. It, it just was a very effective dewormer. And we're not seeing that effectiveness anymore. At least in sheep, we're seeing that um, 
um, of these farms, and these are both the sheep and goat farms, we're seeing about 24 of the 46 farms tested showed um, uh, severe resistance uh, to ivermectin, and we're seeing a clear skew towards that uh, resistant level. Now, moxidectin, which is um, marketed under the uh, trade name Cydectin, moxidectin, a kind of a cousin to ivermectin, and, and acts in a very similar manner, but just with a little bit more potency, um, still has a fair amount of uh, farms that have some susceptibility to this particular drug. Although this um, publication was, came out four years ago, I would suspect that this is moving down a little bit. But also, I would expect that that motion towards resistance should be slowing, because I think a lot of producers have really um, taken to the FAMACHA system and have really started to incorporate that. And it would surprise me if it was moving really fast, but I think the amount of producers in an area where there are a lot of parasites have really adopted the FAMACHA system and use it as a regular management strategy. So collectively, we got ourselves here. I am just as guilty as anybody else listening to this for overusing and prophylactically using dewormers. I ran a sheep farm in Maine for a short period of time and um, I can tell you by the time I was done there, uh, benzimidazoles no longer worked, and ivermectin was going on its way out. So it's a it's a um, it's a management strategy that we thought at the time would actually be good to improve growth, and we actually ended up shooting ourselves in the foot in terms of doing it a little bit too much. So dewormers are great when they work, but they um, have really kind of let us down. Now, if you're thinking that you're in the western United States and this stuff isn't happening out there, I would just be a little bit cautious about a statement like that. I have a friend, uh, one, of the, uh, one of my friends from my uh, college judging team is a high school ag teacher in Escalon, California, and she uh, calls me from time to time to ask me to help with some science fair projects. And so we, we did a study in looking at some anthelmintic resistance on 10 farms in the Escalon area of Central California, and grazing some sheep on irrigated pastures. Each of the farms were used in some different dewormers there. So if we look at uh, what we call fecal egg count reduction, that's our way of testing efficacy of dewormers kind of in the field. So we we, um, we take a fecal egg count at the time that they were dewormed, and we take another fecal egg count two weeks later. We subtract those two numbers, divide them by the original number, then we get a percent um, of uh, fecal egg count reduction. So I have a MAC, one of our kind of favorite drugs to use in this particular scenario, had a fecal egg count reduction of 16%. So we normally expect if a drug is, res or is um, um, highly effective. We expect about a 95% fecal egg count reduction. We're getting 16 with, Iv with Ivamec. We're getting 14% with Cydectin. Um, in the sheep treated with Balbazin, and that this is one of our benzimidazole dewormers, one of the white dewormers, the um, fecal egg count after treatment was actually higher than it was prior to treatment. So in this particular scenario, we're saying that um, Balbazin, uh, or a fecal egg count increased after valvazin treatment by about 56%. So valvazin in this particular scenario wasn't working. So if you're thinking you're in the western states and you're immune to this particular phenomenon and it's only a, a problem that's occurring on the eastern side of the country, I think we, we have to rethink that uh, particular philosophy. I've talked to some folks in, in Nebraska or at the Meat Animal Research Station. They're having problems with um, with anthelmintic resistance and I can I can think anywhere where there's grass growing and we have sheep grazing, we're going to have some level of um, some level of anthelmintic resistance. So, one of the because we have such a problem with anthelmintic resistance, such we have a developing problem with this, please do not stop using FAMACHA. If you haven't started using FAMACHA, find a training session. There's a website called the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. Um, there's a list of trainers in each state where there's uh, training sessions available. Um, if you haven't done this yet, I implore you to, to find a training session and really start incorporating FAMACHA as a part of your parasite management strategy. But I think that, that FAMACHA alone, just like any one tool alone or any one trait selected for, is a, is a failed approach. I think that we have to use this as a part of an integrated approach to parasite management. If we consider some other control strategies that you've probably heard some other talks about in terms of using uh, rotational grazing or incorporating um, treatment with copper oxide wire particles, or even um, introducing high tanning cultivars in your pasture swords. Uh, all of these with FAMACHA should 
um, have a have a fairly good effect on on reducing parasite load um, during the grazing season. But I think that that we also have to consider one other thing, and that's looking at parasite resistant sheep. Now, if you add parasite resistant sheep to this mix, I think that you actually get a lower parasite burden ultimately because you got animals that know how to deal or at least are capable of managing a parasite infection inside themselves. So before we go much further in this talk, I want to clearly define what I mean by parasite resistance. And believe me, it's, it, it can be a little bit difficult to do empirically. But what I mean in the context of parasite resistance in this talk today at this time is, is particularly the type of parasites that we're looking at are trichostrongyloid parasites. And, and of those trichostrongyloid parasites, we're, we're specifically targeting Haemophagus contortus. Now, just because an animal or just because one of these sheep are resistant to Haemophagus contortus does not apply to coccidia. So I don't think that they're, just because they're parasite resistant to nematode parasites, uh, means that they are resistant to intracellular parasites. So I would just want to make sure that we have that clear definition um, or that clear uh, statement defined. Second, I think that we have to kind of uh, be careful with the notion that parasite resistance equals hair sheep. Um, I think that there are some examples of hair sheep that are not parasite resistant due to their heritage and, and, it, and in particular I mean the, the Dorper breed. I think the Dorper breed is a really great uh, breed of sheep. They've offered um, a lot of flexibility in terms of some grazing management and some um, and some change in terms of the style of sheep that are used in uh, grass-based production systems. However, because these sheep um, evolved in an or, or um, uh, were bred and, and developed in an area that that was semi-arid and not necessarily exposed to the parasite burden that you'd see in sheep that were developed or uh, closer to the equator. I don't think that we can imply that these sheep have a lot of uh, parasite resistance and I think most of the scientific data supports a notion um, like that. Likewise, I also think that there are cases of parasite resistance in fleece sheep. And, and I remember uh, particularly dealing with uh, Dr. Settlemeyer and Dr. Parker on the project in Maine. We had a good group of, um, of Suffolk ewes that uh, came from Farm out in Iowa. And these Suffolk ewes, it, or one particular ewe in this group, we just never dewormed. And she was the one that we could put her on the, the dirtiest, nastiest pasture that we had on this project that was loaded with parasites. She just never became infected. So I think that we do have pockets of parasite resistance within these more commercially oriented or, or, or more popular breeds of sheep, if, uh, excuse the, the, the terminology. But um, I think that they're there. The difficulty is identifying them, and that's what, really what it comes down to. So for, for all intents and purposes, I, I think for this particular talk today, we're going to refer to as parasite-resistant sheep or animals that have lower fecal egg counts throughout the grazing season. They have a numerically lower FAMACHA score, which means a 1 or a 2, and they perform throughout the grazing season. So these animals aren't susceptible to the effects of parasitism where you get a lot of weight gain or weight loss. Um, you get animals that are poor doing on pastures. Now, I think that we also have to be care, careful about the term lower, and especially in comparison to my farm versus my neighbor's farm. Lower is relative to the contemporary group average on my farm. So remember, these fecal egg counts don't really um, travel well. So they really refer to what's happening on your particular farm. And, and it's an it's a indication and a reference of the infection level on your particular pastures and not your neighbors. And that and also that the that parasite resistant sheep are not devoid of parasites. I think that we have to get away from the idea of sterility of parasite infection. We can't treat grazing parasites or these pasture parasites like we do heartworms and dogs. We don't want to treat them where we're trying to get them to a sterile infection where we just don't have any in the animals. I think it's okay for an animal to be infected with parasites. I think that's a natural thing that those animals need to do and they need to experience that infection. But the animals that are, are resistant consistently have a lower level infection and they're more resistant to the effects of parasitism. So that leads us into our talk and, and kind of the main thrust of our talk today, which is parasite management from the host perspective. And I really want to address this from two critical approaches. First off, being more from a genetics or selection and crossbreeding approach, where we're getting into um, understanding how this, um, this trait can be passed on and inherited, and, and how we could perhaps do that a little bit faster through crossbreeding. And the second approach would be directly through modulating immune responses. <clears throat> 
I know that I'm inundated on our TV commercials with ways to boost immunity. Um, take Zycam before you get a cold. Uh, you shoot that liquid up your nose and apparently that's supposed to stop you from getting a cold or at least reduce the severity of, of getting a cold. Um, could we do something like that with some of these parasite susceptible sheep and get the same type of response? And I, and I think that's really an intriguing and interesting area to go. But if we talk about a host perspective, I think that we'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't, didn't address this from a genetic standpoint as well. So in terms of the genetics behind resistance, we have to ask ourselves a few questions. Is parasite resistance an inherited trait? And I think largely the answer is yes. How is parasite resistance measured? Currently, we're using a fecal egg count as the measurement for parasite resistance because this is our actual only measurement in a live animal of um, actual parasite load. This is going to vary throughout the year. So that variance in the way fecal egg count varies throughout the year will also affect the heritability or the proportion of the phenotype or that phenotypic variance that is due to genetics. So the heritability of parasite resistance, depending on what study you look at, will vary between about 1% of it due to genetics to about 50% due to genetics. So when animals that are tested have a larger parasitic load, the heritability of fecal egg count improves. So animals that are challenged, animals that have um, been exposed to a parasite infection and actually had a challenge and are, are clearing it by themselves, uh, we get a better um, indication of the heritability of that particular trait. And the Katahdin breed specifically, heritability has been reported to be near 0.5. I think what, um, what Nodder and the Katahdin group there are reporting are about the heritability of uh, 0.48, which indicates that there's a large genetic component um, that uh, should respond well to selection. If you've got a, it, it, typically we don't see fitness traits or traits that are involved in disease resistance to be so highly heritable. But I think that we've really targeted and, and that, um, that Dr. Parker and Dr. Nodder it, um, and some of the other folks that decided this eight-week fecal egg count, I think they landed on a time that was fairly indicative of lifetime performance of uh, reduced parasite load. So I, I, I think that we've got some, some hope and, and some promise in, in using the, the fecal egg count EPD that the Katahdin breed is calculating. But used appropriately, I think that we can also get similar results by crossbreeding using a parasite-resistant breed, and it can be done quite um, quite a bit faster. You know, improvement within breed, even though we have a highly heritable trait, is going to require more time because we just don't have the concentrations of genetics of animals that are super resistant. We don't have a lot of animals that are very resistant um, uh, to um, homonchus in the Suffolk population. So identifying those individuals and actually incorporating it into a breeding program is going to slow down the progress to be made within breed. So the typical culprits in terms of using um, crossbreeding or, or using parasite resistant sheep or identifying parasite resistant breeds include the Gulf Coast native, the St. Croix, and the Barbados black belly. Now some of you on the other end of the line here may be a little frustrated and say, well what about Katahdins? And I think that Katahdins do have a level of parasite resistance, but I think that most of the data indicate and due to their heritage the Katahdins don't have the amount of parasite resistance that we find in these other breeds um, that don't have some of the other traits that Katahdins do. So um, Katahdins tend to land intermediate in their resistance, certainly more resistant than the Suffolk, but less resistant than the St. Croix. So these are our typical culprits. Where do they come from? Um, these sheep originate from um, areas close to the equator, the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. When you think about these areas of, this, of the world, think very tropical climates, um, places that are loaded with grass, where you've got grass year-round, you've got those warm and hot, wet climates year-round. It's a perfect environment for parasites, but why do these sheep still exist? And that's really what my focus has been on in my research at uh, WVU since I came here in, in uh, February of uh, 2011. We wanted to see what happens in the St. Croix sheep during their first infection, the first time that they see a parasite um, um, infection. And we can do this because we can lamb um, parasite resistant sheep on an elevated floor barn and what happens is those little babies are never exposed to um, 
to any pasture parasites that have never been exposed to any pasture. So we can create what we call naive lambs, and that's um, um, this first line here. These are naive lambs. Then we can give them their primary or uh, initial infection, and that's this group right here. And the challenge infection group or the challenge group are a group of animals that have received a primary infection. They were dewormed five weeks later. They were rested for four weeks and then reinfected. So if you take a look what happens when we do this on this elevated floor barn at uh, West Virginia University in Morgantown, across the x-axis or weeks after infection on the y-axis or fecal egg count and eggs per gram, you see that the primary infection, about three weeks after infection, what we normally expected, the fecal egg count goes up, it rises, excuse me, it rises up here to about 3250, and then it drops to zero by five weeks after infection. There was no dewormer given to that group of primary lambs. They did that by themselves. The second time that we do this and we give them a challenge infection, they never develop a fecal egg count. So their fecal egg count across all time points after receiving a dose of 10,000 uh, Homoccus contortus larvae, they never develop an infective load. Now, if you compare that to Suffolk crossbred lambs that experience the same kind of environment and the same type of um, experimental design, these naive lambs across the x-axis, you can see in blue, they never get an infection, no, no egg output from those animals. The primary lambs, they shoot up in three weeks to 7,000 eggs per gram, which is more than double what we see from the St. Croix lambs during their primary infection. But the Suffolk crossbred lambs are not able to clear the infection by themselves. During the challenge infection, same thing over here, we see these lambs actually develop a fecal egg count. And they can't clear it. So what we think and what we hypothesize and we suppose is happening is that these animals just aren't developing a proper or um, full protective immunity to the parasite. Even though we're seeing a reduction and the amount of eggs per gram produced, we're not seeing as much reduction as we see in the St. Croix lambs, and this level of infection is still quite high. If you look at this challenge infection, it's more akin to the primary infection in the St. Croix lambs. So, is this difference large enough for you to begin thinking about incorporating St. Croix sheep into your breeding program? So, the problem and, and the confusion, or, or not necessarily the confusion, but the really key and, and the holy grail of the future of genetic selection is the ability to identify resistant individuals without requiring that they become infected. So if you are to use St. Croix sheep in a breeding program, how do you know that all of those resistant genes got transferred to that progeny? We just don't know after each crossing how those genes are, are um, segregating and going um, uh, with those animals. We can still use fecal egg count as a means to select for that, but it's just not a test that can be done at any time, regardless of age, production system, parasite exposure, or breed. We just don't have that test. We don't have a scrapey resistance test for, um, uh, for parasite resistance. Uh, ultimately, the reason that we don't have that scrapey resistance test for this, uh, for this trait is that there's a small likelihood that parasite resistance is controlled by a single gene or just a simple marker. It's more uh, likely a, a quantitative trait that's controlled by a multitude of different genes. But really getting at the, genetic is, uh, at the genetics of this trait is going to require that we understand the mechanism that's actually controlling um, parasite resistance. And I think that mechanism, and I think what most of my colleagues would agree, that mechanism is immunity. So the rest of this conversation, the rest of this discussion is going to focus a little bit on immunity, and I don't want to scare anybody off. These are all really great images, and I want to walk everybody through here step by step. So we're going to ask a series of questions and, and, and try to answer those with some data that I've generated through my uh, uh, dissertation work and some of the research that we've done since I've been at WVU. So what happens in a parasite-resistant sheep after they ingest the parasitic larva? So the first thing that happens is that they recruit cells to their abomasum. 
So if we look at this first slide, so all this slide is, as we all know, if you've opened up an abomasum before, there are folds inside the abomasum. And what I've done is I've taken one of these folds, I've cut a section of them out, I've laid them up on their end, and we just take a very fine section of that. That's about five microns thick, so about half the the um, the thickness of a fine wool merino um, uh, piece of fiber. And I've laid that down on the slide and stained that. And what we can do is see the different cells that are infiltrating the area. So in uninfected animals, you see you don't see a propensity a lot of purple cells. So they're here. Um, as we go through the villi of the mucus of the uh, of the abomasum, but not like what you see here. So here's a susceptible sheep at, uh, so this was a um, um, a three-way cross, a Rambouillet, Finn, and Dorset cross that was at Virginia Tech. And you can see that there's a lot of these purple cells that are surrounding the basement membrane of the abomasum. But if you compare this and all the purple that we see here to the massive amount of purple that you see here, I really call this picture kind of an eye of inflammation. So in between the layers of tissue that are right here, what we've had is this in invasion of cells that are coming across this kind of muscle layer and out into the mucosa and trying to deal with this parasite infection. The composition of the cells that, go, that are occurring in this early infection include neutrophils, eosinophils, lymphocytes, and these other cells called macrophages. And these cells are, are pretty critical, and we're going to talk about those a little bit later. So what happens in this parasite-resistant sheep is that they bring upon all these cells, and they're responding to the parasite infection, where you don't see that early response in the susceptible sheep. Now what's also critical to look at is what happens in the, after they ingest this larva is that the lymph node in the abomasum, so this is a cross section right here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. It's that uh, picture on the left. That's a cross section of a lymph node of a hair sheep at day five. It's quite large. You have a lot of accumulation of cells and all these little follicles that are growing inside there. Those follicles are producing cells that are specific to the antigen that is being produced by the parasite. If we look at the lymph node weight that's generated by the hair sheep at seven days after infection, you can see this gradual increase in lymph node or exponential increase in lymph node weight to day seven. It's not happening in these, these uh, Dorset, Rambouillet, Finn, Cross sheep. So you're getting all of this growth and immune response in these animals. Third, we see time and time again greater antibody production. It doesn't mean, it doesn't matter what study. So this was a different study that we submitted for publication where we see that, that um, uh, St. Croix sheep after an infection will rise in their um, level of antibody production to day five. This kind of shifts down towards day 21 and it rises again at day 28 following the development and the cycle of the parasite inside the host. So the accumulation of these, um, these parasite-resistant sheep or an accumulation of all of these events in the parasite-resistant sheep result in this reduced fecal egg count and reduced um, um, infection in this particular experimental condition. Is this the same kind of thing that you would see on pasture? Probably not, because you have to remember that the fecal egg count that I'm showing you here are on lambs that are on an elevated floor and they're not receiving an additional infection that you would see on pasture. But a similar condition occurs, just not as pronounced. So is this difference large enough for you to begin to think about incorporating St. Croix sheep in your breeding program? Well, unfortunately, with all of the differences in immunity that we found, we still don't have that one key piece of evidence that would serve as a selectable marker, right? So if that's the case, and if that's, we just don't have that way to select those animals, let's consider the following statement. It's not that parasite-susceptible sheep are incapable of responding to a parasite infection, Rather, that their response is blocked by either a parasite-derived mechanism or by a lack of what I call immunological awareness. Now, most immunologists don't like it when I say that, but it really is um, kind of the, 
an easier way of, of saying that these animals just don't respond when they become infected. And if it's a lack of immunological awareness, that may be something that we can fix. So we did this small study at, at Virginia Tech, and, and pardon me if we get a little super scientific on you. This is a neutrophil cell, and these are the cells of those first responders. So if you remember back to that first slide with the purple pictures on there, you remember that neutrophil cells were a part of the cell infiltrate into this animal. We added parasite antigen to those cells, incubated them for 24 hours. So then we took these, these uh, neutrophil cells from the St. Croix sheep that had been added with antigen, neutrophils from suffix that had been added with antigen, and added them to the opposite type of lymphocyte. So that would be our responder cell. So what happens when we do this is that these suffix lymphocytes can respond to activation from neutrophils from St. Croix. But if we look at the, uh, the opposite situation, we don't see that. So it's not that the suffix sheep can't respond, it's that they're not receiving a signal to respond. And I think that's kind of the hypothesis of where we're going, and which leads us to the idea of what's called immunomodulation. So this is simply just the adjustment of an immune response to a desired level. And the example of this was in a study published in 2009 in a journal called Parasite Immunology, where the authors there used uh, lipopolysaccharide or bacterial cell wall components and injected those into sheep prior to giving them an experimental homonchus contortus infection, and what they found was that they reduced fecal egg count by 50% 50, 50 at 35 days after infection, basically modulating the immune response of those particular animals. In their own study that we've done here at West Virginia University, by using dietary immuno, immunomodulation, so in essence we fed these sheep uh, kind of a yogurt. Um, we fed them a prebiotic dietary supplement for one week prior to homonchus contortus infection. These are lambs that have been challenged before. You can see that even in a challenged individual, they did not develop immunity to clear that parasite infection. The lambs that received this experimental treatment had a fecal egg count reduction of 62% without any drugs. So is this what immunomodulation looks like during a parasite infection? Boy, I just don't know. I think this is where we're heading in the future with all of this. But what we really have to do is we have to understand the mechanism of prebiotic immunomodulation. And I, I think that this, what it's doing, and, and what, the, what the research community thinks that is going on here, is that we have an upregulation of early innate host immune defenses. So that's activation of those macrophage cells that we talked about earlier, recruitment of neutrophils and stimulation of some of these other cells that really could have effect on the host and in, in res, in resisting parasite infection. Immunomodulation bears a striking resemblance to early immune responses generated by parasite resistant sheep. So remember we talked about all of those cells that are accumulating at the site of infection. Well, those are the same cells that might that we believe are upregulated. Um, during this modulation. And is there a reduced FEC, um, is this um, reduced fecal egg count observed really a result of enhanced innate immunity? And I think that's the uh, million dollar question that we have to ask. And, and I think that's where a lot of this feature is going. So my take on the future of parasite management comes down to one fundamental question. How do we make our commercial crossbred lambs behave immunologically like our St. Croix sheep? And that's really kind of the, what's driving my research and, and, and some others as we, um, as we look um, uh, worldwide. You can certainly take the genetics route with this and using selection for, um, uh, for fecal, egg, or fecal egg count as a commitment to a breeding program, which you, you may not see results as fast um, as a few generations. It may take eight or ten generations before you really see anything. We know that we can improve the speed in which you what you're going to observe um, improvement in fecal egg count just by crossbreeding, but I think that we have to consider some of the other effects of crossbreeding in terms of reduced carcass size in those animals. You can have a serious impact on wool quality depending on the breed that you use, and then it really comes down to the question of accurately selecting those crossbred parasite resistant progeny, and that, that becomes a difficult thing the further you get out from that initial cross. So I think that there's a role for immunomodulation. It's an advantage for purebred producers. You don't have to give up the ship. You don't have to 
incorporate some of these parasite resistant braids that may not be your uh, cup of tea. And, and this um, I see as a as a really simple and, and, and fairly logical solution for some of these purebred pre producers, but I don't want to get everybody excited too fast. We, we've got to verify the efficacy of this immunomodulation on parasite reduction. Um, we've seen a few studies that are working on this, and I'd hate to get everybody excited on something that doesn't end up panning out, but I think this is really a um, there's a lot of good science behind this that can drive this forward. We've got to characterize that upregulated immune activation that's occurring both in the hair sheep and, or both in the St. Croix sheep and these immunomodulated animals. And we've got to understand the effects of immunomodulation on the whole animal before we start uh, transferring this technology to be used on farm. The great thing about this is that in terms of the food animal integrated research uh, proposal that's put forth by the Federated so or Animal Science Society, it has been identified as one of their key topics. So that's improving animal health through feed. What that means is that this provides researchers an opportunity to have an advantage in terms of applying for grants to specifically fund this type of research and it provides sheep producers um, some real answers that can be um, come down the line. So in closing, I think that there's some exciting times ahead. Um, I hate to look through this from too much of a rose-colored glasses standpoint, but I really am excited in terms of the um, um, the future of immunomodulation and, and dealing with parasite problems. I, I'm excited about uh, a better understanding of uh, parasite infection um, in these sheep and, and really helping out producers deal with this um, with this problem. So um, there's a few people I need to thank with all this. Um, my uh, immunology lab at uh, West Virginia University, my collaborators at Virginia Tech, both Dr. Scott Greiner and Ann Zajac, um, and the funding support that we've uh, received uh, both on uh, a federal support and in our, um, in our private funding support. And with that, um, I'm happy to, um, to address any questions that you folks may have. Thank you, Scott. And uh, we do have a few questions that came in during the presentation, and I'll go ahead and ask one of them to start with, and then I'll, I'll get to some of the other ones that have been typed in. And if, if you want to ask your question verbally, uh, once again, just click the uh, hand icon uh, and raise your hand, and then uh, assuming you have a microphone connected, uh, we'll be able to go ahead and call on you. Okay, one of the questions that came in um, early on was, does anyone know if there is an online FAMASHA training? And this, you mentioned that website again, the American Consortium website. Mm -hmm. um, would you um, mind repeating that and give some people directions for this type of training when there's nothing available on the ground in their area? That's the tough thing because the um, there's there's a restriction on the administration or the <clears throat> or the um, deliverance of the the charts to producers. We really want you to get your hands on some sheep and pull their eyelid down and really show you in person on some animals that are infected. So unfortunately, online training is not something that I know of personally to be developed. Um, there are some some regional trainings and. Um, I think that website is the American Consortium, so let me spell this out as we go, American Consortium of Small Ruminant Parasite Control, so that would be ACSRPC. I think there are links to that website through Susan Shonian's um, sheepandgoats.com website um, where you can get access to some of those um, uh, trainers that are in your particular region. Okay. And we have some hands up, so I'm going to go ahead and call on one of the people there. Kevin uh, Triller, if you're out there, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone and see if uh, – are you there, Kevin? Okay. Um, Kevin, are you there? Not hearing him. Uh, Michelle Danforth, you had your hand up also. Let me go ahead and see if we can catch you. Michelle? Michelle? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go yes, ahead. Can. Oh, okay, great. I didn't know if I had a microphone or not. Um, I was just wondering, are, uh, do you have a list of things that would be great on feeding the sheep? Um, we've tried, you know, the kelp and uh, putting it with the hay and other things like that. Do you have a other list of things that would be great for producers? I think that some folks have been trying to uh, feed dried Circea lespedisa. That's one of those high tannin forages. 
Uh, we've been seeing, they've been seeing some improvement on, on parasite uh, reduction in those. If you're thinking garlic or um, some of those type of things, there just isn't the empirical evidence that shows that they are going to reduce fecal egg count. It seems to be very um, anecdotal and we just haven't been able to repeat any of those studies. Even with like pumpkin seeds and other things like that? Yeah, I mean, some people are trying that. It just is non-repeatable. So sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Mm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Scott, one of the other questions that came in was, can we consider vaccinating our wool sheep to incur encourage immune reactions? That's a great question. And I think that's kind of where we're headed eventually. And, and, and Jim Miller and, and some other folks, in, uh, both in Louisiana and, and internationally, have toyed with the notion of vaccinating animals for um, parasite resistance. Unfortunately, we just have not gotten the great vaccine response. And whether that's a function of the, the adjuvant effect or, or the carrier of the vaccine or the particular antigen itself, um, it really isn't known. We don't know, and, and this goes for a lot of different models, we don't know what the immune response is targeting on the parasite. So what we're doing is just guessing. We're guessing that they're getting this one uh, particular protein. So um, we, we really have got to, um, it, it's not like a bacteria where we know there are particular surface molecules on a bacterium that the immune response targets and then it activates um, as a result of signaling from, from uh, grabbing that one particular target. We don't know what that target is on parasite infections. And until we know that, we're not going to have a really good vaccine to um, show any kind of efficacy or any kind of improved protection um, in our parasite susceptible sheep. Okay, thank you. Uh, another person with their hand raised, Nicole Heath. I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone, and if you're there, there. Nicole, can you hear us? Nicole, are you there? Sounds like she might have her microphone working. But... Okay, let's go to one of the other uh, submitted questions that we have here. Um, has to do with, with getting some questions on feed additives. Um, this one says, is there a feed additive that can help improve the immunomodulation in lambs? Well, if there was, I'd be telling you about it right now. That's what we're working on. Um, and that's really the, kind of the goal and focus of some of the research that I'm doing here at WVU is, is trying to figure out what that particular additive would be. Um, it's, partic it's a specific mechanism, so what is it targeting? How is it working in the animal? So we can really not just say, well, here's an additive to feed to your lambs. Um, here's a, what we would like to do is say, here's an additive to feed it to them at this period of time. So it's not something that constantly has to be in there. You can kind of, um, um, if you can predict when they're going to be infected, and we kind of know when that is. When you dump those lambs out on pasture, we know that they're going to be exposed to parasites. So if you feed them that prior to that pasture exposure, we may set up the immune response for a better, or, or the immune system for a better response upon exposure. But if any particular uh, feed additive right now, I just don't know of any that um, I would be comfortable saying is a, is a bona fide and guaranteed um, feed additive that's going to reduce fecal egg count in your lambs. Okay. Thank you. And we have a question on, another question on wool sheep. Have there been enough studies done to know if there are wool breeds that have more resistance? Yeah, there haven't, and that's that's the that's the hard thing. And you know, it, it's going to take a, a a large number of sheep to really kind of target that group. Unfortunately, the the great thing about hair sheep and the great thing about these St. Croix sheep is we know that the large majority of them are are parasite resistant, and we don't have to search for that. Um, searching for animals that are parasite uh, resistant costs a lot of money. And in this uh, economic climate and doing research um, at a university level, we don't have the money we used to um, to keep as many sheep on, um, on the university farm. So we really have to target and limit our research to get the most bang for our buck, and that's, um, that's why we're using the St. Croix animals. Okay. Um, Diane Cox, you have your hand up. I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphone. Diane, are you there? 
I am, but um, since I raised my hand, my question has been answered. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, another question that um, came in in terms of worming. It said, uh, is worming prior to lambing effective as prevention for lambs, and with what drug and what pregnancy stage? Um, <clears throat> there are some drugs that uh, we caution producers about uh, using prior to lambing, and I think it's clearly labeled on the drug. One of the drugs is valbazin or any of the finbendazoles. Um, uh, usually it, it's, it's printed on the label not to deworm during the first 30 days of pregnancy, and if you know the first 30 days of pregnancy, um, more power to you. Um, you'll know when those animals are, are able to use that drug. And we'll also say on the bottle whether or not they're effective against hypobiotic larvae. Um, the ones that we usually um, consider having the most effect against hypobiotic larvae are the macrolytic lactones or um, cydectin, ivamac, those type of drugs. Giving them prior to lambing um, can have a, a potent effect on those animals. As long as they use, and, and this is really the key, as long as you allow them or even allow the hypobiotic larvae to, um, or allow those used to shed their eggs inside a barn and not out on pasture. And I think that's really what the, the key comes down to is um, a little bit of drug treatment and a little bit of knowledge about when those ewes are shedding eggs. And they're, they're going to shed eggs in that periparturiant period, um, uh, two, three weeks before lambing and that, that time after lambing when they're slightly immunocompromised. So um, that's when those ewes are going to shed lambs. Then your lambs are going to pick up those parasites about 30 days later and, and thus results in spring rise and those lambs getting infected right around weaning. So what we have to be careful about is, is letting those ewes go out and shedding, shedding parasites on pasture. And one easy way to manage that um, um, but using drugs and a little bit of common sense is just don't let them out um, if you can afford to do that. Okay, thank you. Let's see, we have, uh, we have lots of questions with words I tr struggle to pronounce. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts or proposed mechanisms for induction of hypobiosis in homunculus in response to climatic conditions? Is this an area of active study? It's tough. Uh, <laughs> we, can't, um, we can't raise homunculus in vitro. So because homonchus requires the host to develop to the adult stage, we really have no way to model what happens inside the animal in an environment where, that we can control. The best information that we have was published in some articles probably, I think it was lot, uh, maybe two years ago by a guy named Beasley. And what they, uh, they did a series of studies looking at the effect of pregnancy hormones on the um, um, on the initiation of hypo, or not initiation, but the ex, or, um, the the worms coming out of hypobiosis, and I, I think that's where most of our correlation comes. So as you as you think about what's happening as you get closer to pregnancy, progesterone levels are dropping inside the ewe. You're going to have a life, you're going to have a, a breakdown of the corpus luteum. Um, you're going to have a, less progesterone and more prostaglandins being produced by that use. So um, that certainly could be one of the signals, but I just don't think we have, again, that really key mechanism. And I think for the for the, ant, or for the worm coming out of hypobiosis, I think it's largely due to some of those pregnancy hormones. But what causes them to go into hypobiosis, I think, is much of a mystery. Okay. Um, another question typed in, do you know if the innate immunomodulation responsible for the St. Croix effect is also responsible for differences within the more susceptible breeds? For example, resistance in susceptible animals within the wool sheep in particular. Yeah, and that's exactly what's happening. So we didn't modulate immune responses in the St. Croix sheep because there's no need to. And actually the St. Croix sheep and some of our early data is suggesting that the St. Croix sheep are not don't respond to immunomodulation. So we're only getting an effective immunomodulation when we do it in animals that need it. So um, what we're seeing right now um, in terms of the animals that are that we're immunomodulating in the Suffolk crossbred lambs is that they are um, generating a, a lower fecal egg count. We are seeing a, a higher recruitment of uh, some of these innate uh, immune cells that are at least getting in the periphery and the blood. Um, we're working on the, um, we're right in the middle of doing the um, 
the, the more specific and local immune response um, at the site of infection. So I, I, I'm encouraged and, and hopeful uh, for some of that data as it comes out. Okay. Um, a question on identifying resistant individuals. Uh, how much difference from the contemporary group in uh, fecal egg count would need to be there for an individual animal to be considered resistant? Ooh, that's a good question. Sounds like a geneticist has asked me that question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I, I really don't know the best answer to that because it, it just depends on how, I mean, the, the contemporary group average. I, you know, I, I usually think that an animal that has less than less than 1,000 H per gram is, the, uh, um, is something that you want to shoot for. Um, but it, um, it just, it just, depends on the particular scenario and how much of an emphasis that you want to put on on that particular trait. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Parker has uh, suggested that animals less than 500 um, H per gram at that eight week uh, uh, fecal egg count are the are the ones that we should be selecting for. And I think that the cutoff range um, that they're looking at for uh, fecal egg count EPDs was about 2,000 H per gram. So if you've got some some variation where you've got a significant drop or a, a, what you feel to be a significant reduction from the from the group average. I, I say that each person's going to have to make that decision on their own before we start uh, doing the wholesale um, uh, thresholds in terms of uh, difference from the contemporary group average. Okay, and we have a question in regards to a study that was done uh, at the USDA Appalachian Lab uh, near Beckley, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. It says they had some early results deworming with orange peels ground as a feed additive. Have you heard of any follow-up with that research? Well, since that uh, station has been closed, there will be no follow-up on that part of that research. Um, the, uh, and some of that research, they, they were feeding it to animals, and they also did, uh, they fed uh, emulsified orange oils to gerbils um, as uh, you know, as a, as a means to control parasite infections. They did some of that work down at Virginia Tech, and, and they saw, in, in even feeding some lambs, I was involved in the trial there where they were doing that, and they saw some good um, results with that. It, it, again, it's, it's um, the consistency of what we're seeing in some of the feed additives and the actual mechanism of what is occurring is, is the, is, um, the current state of affairs. So even if we talk about feeding high tannin uh, grasses, we're still at the point of what is the what are the tannins or what are these orange oils or is it the tannins in the orange oils that are actually um, <clears throat> causing the problem? So what we're doing to address that, and we're not necessarily doing the orange <clears throat> the orange peel study, but we're going to start raising. Um, um, bird's foot trefoil um, in West Virginia, New York. Uh, Rhode Island, um, and use the, the um, um, that bird's foot trefoil as a high tannin forage to feed animals to see if we can reduce parasite loads in those um, in those animals. So in the Appalachian region, as you move further northeast, bird's foot trefoil grows a little bit better in our soils than than, than Circe lespedeza does. Um, since we see so much of an effect with um, with lespedeza, we're hoping to see the same type of effect. We just got a um, USDA organic grant to do that uh, research where we're studying both the effect of tannins on immune responses as well as the effect of tannins as an anthelmetic. So we're trying to approach this problem from two sides and seeing which, which is the true mechanism or if they're both playing a role. Okay, good. Uh, Sonia asks, is it best to change wormers uh, within a year of worming or do you use one wormer until it does not work anymore and then change to a different one? Oh yeah, that was the that was what we were all taught was to keep rotating dewormers, and and the the hypothesis at the time was that it kept worms on their toes. Um, what uh, I think what most of the parasitologist community now is is come to the realization that um, you stick with one dewormer until it does not work anymore, because then you'll know what your parasites are resistant to. Okay. Um, once they, once you find that that dewormer is no longer working, then you switch to an alternate class of dewormers. Okay. Um, Betsy has asked, uh, 
Um, she says one challenge when selecting using uh, FAMASHA scores is that the best uh, producers, the best producing ewes, those nursing twins or triplets, are more likely to have a large worm load due to stress from raising multiple lambs. Do you, uh, so do you take that into account when making decisions? And then a follow-up to that is do you do a lot of individual fecal egg counts? Well, I do a lot of individual fecal egg counts. I would definitely not take a FAMACHA score from a ewe that was milking twins out on pasture that had limited resources to to maintain healthy. I mean, I don't think that's a that's not indicative of a parasite infection. That's indicative of the nutritional status of the ewe and not necessarily predictive of her ability to resist parasite infection. That's just her trying to survive while she's lactating and nursing two lambs. Um, I think that we have to be cautious about when we're testing the animals to have that predictive value on lifetime performance. And I think what uh, what um, the folks at the NSIP and, and through Lamb Plan have developed is, is that eight-week fecal egg count as being the time that, that's going to give us a, a better um, a better sense of um, parasite resistance, and I actually think it also helps us indirectly select for total parasite resistance, where selection simply for FAMACHA score may limit you to um, selection for just homonchus resistance. And what we're seeing, and, and some of the papers are a little dicey about this, and 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 a little um, it, it kind of goes both ways. But um, if you're resistant against homonchus, that doesn't necessarily you're mean that you're resistant against, you're resistant against trichostrongylus. So if you just select for FAMACHA, you may be indirectly selecting for susceptibility to trichostrongylus. Where okay. fecal egg count would give you a more broad approach to parasite resistance. Okay. Um, just a couple of more uh, questions in here. Um, Bud is uh, said he had a problem with the homunculus catortis last spring, and he asked the question, can you recommend a safe warmer to use on young lambs, three to four months of age? I think all the dewormers are safe to use on young lambs. I don't think that's an issue at all. I think that we have to be, um, uh, it, especially if you're dealing with levamisol, you've got to be very critical and very specific and very accurate in the delivery of levamisol to lambs because that will kill them. Um, if you overdose levamisole. If you also, if, if you've got a heavily infect, infected lamb and you give them a dewormer, that can also have, a, have an impact on the lamb. So I think that we have to be careful with those lambs. I think one of the things that you want to do is, is uh, hold the feed on the lambs, hold the water on the lambs, um, give them ample medics that, uh, that will work in, in terms of Ivamac or um, uh, or, or not even Ivamec, but at least moxidectin, and then follow that up a week later with a um, with an albendazole or finbendazole if they're working. Um, if not, then follow that up with levamisole to see if you can get clearance of that parasite. But I wouldn't go um, full bore and, and give them every drug that was on the market. I, I think I would be a little bit more judicious in the use of, of dewormers and make sure that you're really deworming them accurately as, and, and going by the weights and the and the um, recommendations on, on delivery of those of those dewormers. Okay. And then we have a couple uh, of questions. One more came in here that I want to ask, so we got two left that I wanted to cover. Um, Chris has said, do you know how long this parasite lives in the fecal matter on pasture? Um, so if we were rot rotational grazing, for example. Well, the parasite can live in an environment for, for a good good period of time, and, and, and it has this cuticle that allows it to survive in the environment. What really, what's going to allow that parasite to to die on pasture is, is just, a, you know, it's probably going to die in a, in a couple months anyway, in, in three or four months, but what what else is going to help it die is if there's any desiccation. So if you have an opportunity to take an egg cutting off that pasture, that's something that we recommend. It just adds some desiccation to that pasture, get some of that um, um, get some of that forage off the field in that area that retains a lot of moisture. Um, if, if you're rotational grazing, I mean, what we do in some of the organic studies that we're doing now is we recommend a one to two day uh, rotation. So we're not um, we're not coming back to the same pasture for about 56 days, um, and even as high as 60 days or 70 days, just depending upon the, the amount of rainfall and the amount of dry matter that's out on the pasture. So um, I, I 
I think that rotational grazing certainly plays a role in this, um, and I'm not um, I'm not as fluent in the specifics in terms of of giving it a precise a day in terms of how long that's going to be on pasture or how long that parasite's going to survive. <laughs> it, it it really is going to vary with the humidity and some of the environmental conditions that exist on the pasture. Okay, and then one final question on clarifying. Um, what is meant by an eight-week fecal egg count? Is that eight weeks old or after eight weeks on pasture or what exactly? Eight weeks of age. So that's, um, that's, um, that's the eight-week fecal egg count. So that's, what, that's, the, par or that's the, the measurement that they're taking. Um, they'll split those up into contemporary groups based on their production system. Um, so if, you're, if the lambs haven't been out on pasture as long as other lambs, they'll be broken into different groups. Okay. And if they have different fecal egg counts, they'll be broken into different contemporary groups and, and compared that way. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you for that, and uh, thank you for all your attendance tonight, this evening, and um, we appreciate you all sticking in there. We had pretty good attendance tonight and good questions coming in. Um, I want to go ahead and uh, uh, give thanks again to um, our um, providers for funding this evening, and that would be the American Sheep Industry uh, Association and uh, the Rebuild the Sheep Industry Program, and uh, also the uh, National Sheep Industry Improvement Center um, for their help in providing funding here. Uh, you should be seeing on your screen right now uh, my email contact, and right below that at the bottom of the screen is uh, the growourflock.org uh, website, um, which is a part of the American Sheep Industry website, and it's on the resources page there that you will uh, find the recording for this and for all of our uh, uh, seminars, webinars that we've been putting on here this fall. And uh, also you will be receiving a follow-up email with a link uh, in it um, that will take you directly to the recording uh, for this webinar. Uh, and feel free to share that uh, that link with others. if. Uh, if you have somebody else that didn't see the webinar that you want to share it with, um, it is open to the public for viewing. So, um, Scott, I want to thank you for your presentation and your patience in, in addressing all the questions that we had. Um, and uh, you see contact information on there for Scott. He was um, kind enough to, to put that out on the national stage. So I'll let him deal with the email questions he may or may not get as a result of this. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for their attendance. Thank you, Jay. Enjoy the opportunity. It's really fun. Okay. Everybody have a wonderful evening and uh, happy holidays to all of you. Thank you.